1975, he became Hollywood's biggest star. And in 1978, just when you thought it was safe to go back in the water, he resurfaced. This summer, for the first time, the terror of Jaws will not stop at the edge of the screen. The all-new Jaws 3D, rated PG. Now playing at a theater near you. Hey there, welcome back to another video. This time around, it is my review of the 1983 sequel, Jaws 3D. Now, Jaws 3D is one of those gimmick films that was released around this time that was trying to cash in on the resurgence of 3D. And initially... The studio didn't even want to do a 3D Jaws film. They wanted to do a parody. A very ambitious, out-of-the-box parody called Jaws 3 People Zero. That involved the National Lampoon's uh, guys. I think Joe Dante was uh, supposed to direct. Featured a script that had uh, writing by such talents as John Hughes. And it was going to be a parody of not only the Jaws franchise, but horror films and Hollywood in general. And Universal was very close to doing National Lampoon's Jaws 3 People Zero. But Steven Spielberg, he heard about what they were planning on doing with Jaws 3, and he didn't like it. And he was vehemently against it. And that news then spread to the head of Universal at the time. And they decided to not go ahead with it. They, they decided, we're going to go in a different direction. Because Spielberg, one of our cash cows, does not like uh, this concept. And in retrospect, I can see where Spielberg is coming from because you are turning this franchise into a joke on purpose. But for some people, I think they would have liked that more than Jaws 3 because they felt that it was turning the franchise into a joke, period. Why not actually be in on the joke? But I think this film could have been either a surprise hit with some really clever writing or it could have been a very lame uh, and genuinely embarrassing film that would have done more damage to the Jaws franchise than either Jaws 3 or Jaws the Revenge combined. It was all about the execution and I just... I don't think that it was a good idea at the time. Uh, I'm one of those people that actually thinks of the idea that they ultimately chose to go with, with having a killer shark in a amusement park, I felt that that was a better concept. And it still provided something different. It provided a completely unique setting for the franchise, but it enabled things to be showcased in a way where it wasn't a parody. If this was uh, not a part of the Jaws franchise and it was just some kind of parody of Killer Shark movies and Hollywood and so on, it was just National Lampoon's Killer Shark or something, I think that would have worked. But making it an actual part of the franchise, that's essentially saying we have no appreciation or respect for the franchise anymore. We're just deliberately turning it into a joke because we've run out of ideas. And there's a reason why you don't have sequels that are parodies of themselves because that's normally not something that studios think of at the time. So, yes, it was ambitious, it was different, but I don't think it was really the right... Uh, direction to take this franchise so universal felt the same way 
but I think it was more really Spielberg and his opinion that caused them to uh, change gears. So they decided to go with a screenplay based on a story by uh, Girdon True Blood, and the script was written by Richard Matheson and Carl Gottlieb, uh, and they settled on the shark and sea world idea and then they decided to tag the 3d gimmick onto it to entice more people to come see the film in the theater and they got joe alves who was their original choice to direct jaws 2 to direct now joe alves's direction in this it's not the worst but it's not that great either i would say the direction is definitely one of the film's flaws uh this is a movie that should have had more spectacle should have had more awe and there are a lot of moments where it has the vibe and feel of a tv movie and that's due to joe alves's inexperience as a director he doesn't know how to make certain shots and certain scenes pop visually in a way that a more established director would have been able to do. And I think having it be 3D also hurt him a lot because it made it so he had to focus so much of his time and his effort on these 3D gimmicks. And if he didn't have to deal with all of that... Maybe his direction would have been uh, improved because he could have had more of a focus on what kind of shots he was going to go with and so on. He would have had more flexibility as well because you're not as flexible as a director if you're doing a 3D movie because you have to have a certain amount of shots that are just there for the 3D effect and... I definitely feel the 3D elements, speaking of 3D, those are honestly some of the weakest points uh, of Jaws 3D. I think they are ultimately detrimental to the film because they have not aged well. Uh, they also really do put a bullseye on the film's worst visual effects. So when you have a scene, like the infamous scene in the end, where you see a giant shark that's floating towards the camera like it's a loaf of bread, it takes you out of the film. It's a bad effect. It was intended to be seen in 3D, but it's still not that good of an effect because the shark doesn't move. And there were a lot of shots like that. Even if you saw it in 3D, I don't think the effect would be that great because of all these other things that are just disappointing or don't work too well. Uh, for for instance, some of the submersible shots, some of the uh, blue screen effects. There's a lot of stuff in this that really uh, does not immerse you in the the uh, landscape. It doesn't. It, it does, it's not a fully immersive experience as a as a viewer because you're seeing the the strings or or you're seeing the fact that this is intended for 3d and so on and i think some of that would definitely be uh corrected if you saw it in 3d but a lot of that is just amplified when you watch it in 2d because of the fact that all of this all of these visual effects that were intended for 3d screens do not translate well on 2d uh, televisions or in the 2d f format but yeah joe alves's direction it's not horrible it's not incompetent it's not piss poor by any means there are some moments where it it, it actually is a little impressive like the shots of the giant shark when it's swimming underwater uh the confrontation between the the shark and uh, and uh mike brody I thought that was a pretty uh, tense sequence. The moment with uh, Manimal himself, Simon McCorkendale's character, when he gets essentially crushed inside the jaw of the giant shark, 
that was a really well shot, very eerie, very uh, creepy sequence. And so there's a there are some moments here with the direction where it's dynamic enough, it's it's solid enough. But there's a lot of shots though, and there's a lot of moments in this where it just feels very run of the mill. And that's because of the fact that Joe Alves never directed anything before this. And he didn't direct anything again after this, if I remember correctly. This was the only film that he ever directed. Now, the screenplay, it's got a few really strong points and strong positives. One of them is the setting. I love the fact that this takes place at SeaWorld. It's unique. It's fun. And the undersea kingdom and the underwater tunnels that adds a lot of extra uh, suspense and intrigue. And I don't mind the idea of having the baby shark and having it be caught and then having the whole politics with Lugasa Jr.'s character putting the shark out too early for display and then it dying and then the mama shark coming for revenge. I don't mind that. I know it's not realistic, but this movie isn't realistic, period. I mean, the, the, the underwater kingdom with the underwater tunnels, that would never fucking happen because uh, it's a lawsuit waiting to happen if anything goes wrong. And... It was way too and way too ambitious, uh, uh, and for the time in terms of the technology, like that was something that was straight out of fantasy land, and you have that going on, and then you got a giant shark. Sure, why not? At this point in the franchise, I think it's a good idea to go big, not small, because Jaws, Jaws, the first film, was the best that you will ever see when it comes to going small with this kind of film. Jaws 2 started to, to veer into that direction of over-the-top spectacle. I mean, the shark eats a helicopter in that movie. So I think this film, just going full speed, speed ahead into a ridiculousness and over-the-top craziness i actually think that's fine and i wish it was even more over the top to be honest i wish to have more of a body count that is something that the film definitely does suffer from it has not nearly as sharp of a bite as the first two even though there are some effective moments here and there uh, a lot of it seems a little tame a lot of it seems definitely uh dull uh and and a little bit deadened in, in comparison uh, and that makes the horror elements of the film a little weak, uh, despite a few instances like the, the guy getting eaten the way that he does inside the shark, and then his body is just left there inside the shark's maw, and then it ultimately uh, leads to the climax where the shark gets blown up again. So where we're already getting to the point where we, we are uh, recycling things, Oh, the shark gets blown up, but this time it's not an air tank, it's a grenade. Um, another strong point about this script is the characters. I honestly really like this cast, and I really like these characters. Uh, this is the best interpretation of Mike Brody to me. In Jaws 2, we, he was an unlikable prick. I hated that character. In Jaws 3... He's uh, a really charismatic, fun, likable guy, and he's not your typical protagonist, and I know people have written a lot of things saying he's one of the worst because of that. I don't think that's the case at all. I think he's still a strong protagonist because of the fact that he's so uh, charismatic, he's so enjoyable to watch and he's having fun and then when he needs to be more serious when he needs to put his life on the line he's also uh capable in doing that and i love i really love the dynamic between um uh, mike and uh his girlfriend uh catherine 
And I felt like the other characters that were brought into the fray, like Calvin Bouchard, uh, who was the owner of the park, I thought there was enough differences with the way he was handling things that, where it didn't seem like they're just trying to copy the Murray Hamilton character from the first two movies. Uh, I liked how the screenplay wrote Sean Brody. Uh, I felt that the relationship that he had with his older brother, Mike was really sweet and, and I really enjoyed their antics and you had other characters like Leia Thompson's character, Kelly. I, I, I really had a lot of fun with that character and, and she had a lot of, nice moments with Sean and I like the idea of having this crocodile hunter guy before crocodile hunter was really a thing. We have this adventure guy who is trying to do a lot of stuff for publicity. And I, I appreciate that angle as well. I like, I like that character, Philip Fitzroyce. And the rest of the cast, they're okay, but for the most part, I, I the main characters, they are written very well to me. They have a lot of fun banter back and forth with one another. There's a lot of things for them to do, and a lot of moments for them to not only interact with one another, but also interact with the park, and interact with the shark, and I, I just... I just like the characters in this. It really helps the film be as enjoyable as it is because of how strong the characters are and how strong their dynamics are. And the shark stuff isn't that bad either. I like the idea of making the shark a little more sympathetic early on and then you bring in the big guns and in this case, a big shark. And... I love, once again, I love the setting of SeaWorld, and I like the fact that it has this vibe of a disaster movie. And I've seen critics say that. It, it really does remind them of a Irwin Allen disaster movie. Instead of the disaster being a fire in a skyscraper, or a sinking ship, or a... Uh, meteor shower or any of this other stuff this time around it's a shark that's uh running rampant in a amusement park and i think that's a really fun concept and i i feel that that alone really does help this film stand out from other killer shark movies and also helps it stand on its own as a separate entry uh separated from jaws or jaws 2 because it it feels like it's it, it's its own condensed uh story and i like the fact that the brody sons are grown up and they are still close to one another i love the the fact that they all live i i really like the fact that None of them die. They make it out alive. I like that they mentioned that Mar Martin Brody, he's still alive too, even though he's not in the film. And there are other aspects of the film that I enjoy. I mean, I like the incorporation of the dolphins uh, and how they are used here. And it's just one of those things where the screenplay, yes, it's got some issues with some of the subplots, some of the scenes, like there's a moment with these guys who were trying to steal something from the park in a raft, and I never really thought that scene was that great, and it seemed like it was only there to add to the body count, and I could see why some people have some issues with the ending, especially when it comes to the visual effects, but that's not really a writing problem. Uh... Overall, I think it's a pretty good script, uh, even though it does have some cracks in the foundation. The cast, I thought, was really strong. Dennis Quaid, he's as charismatic and lovable as ever, 
as uh, Mike Brody. And apparently Dennis was high on the most cocaine he's ever taken in his entire career while he was shooting this movie. I couldn't tell. I really could not tell that he was that coked out of his mind doing this film. Because to me, that's just Dennis. That's just the kind of performance you get from him. You get the wild, uh, crazy, uh, energetic performance. That's why I love Dennis Quaid, is because he's so good at playing these exuberant, really enjoyable characters that you love to watch and you love to be around. And I felt that uh, Mike Brody was definitely one of those characters. And I also really liked Bess Armstrong's take with, with uh, Catherine. Uh, I felt that Bess had some really great chemistry with Dennis. And you really did buy that they were a couple. And they had moments where they would jaw at one another. But it would all come from a place of love. And it really did feel like it was a genuine relationship. And I, I find their dynamic to be quite special and, and cute and, and heartwarming. Uh, Simon McCorkendale, he played the role well of this full of himself glory hound. And uh, Lou Gossett Jr., he's a very capable uh, and, and very strong actor, and I felt he had a good presence here. And, and, uh, <clears throat> and I felt that he was a nice addition to the cast in terms of having him be the main guy who was the head of the park and he was making some of these questionable decisions. I liked his no-nonsense take on things. John Putch, I had a lot of fun with him. I thought he and Leah Thompson had some really electric chemistry with one another. And I also felt that he got along really well with Dennis Quaid and Bess Armstrong. And that's really the main cast. I mean, there are some other actors like P.H. Moriarty plays Jack Tate, who is Philip Fitzroy's right hand man. I do want to mention him because I thought his performance was really strong, too. I mean, the scene where he's figuring out that Philip is not there. He's not going to make it. He's stuck in the tunnel and he's not coming out. I thought that was some really good acting on his part, showing grief and and uh, a lot of desperation because it it was his friend and his friend was trapped down there and his friend was probably dead. And I felt that th that was a really believable performance. I felt that those two had some nice chemistry as well. Uh... That's the main cast. I mean, there are some other actors like uh, Harry Grant as Shelby Overman. He was fine. Uh, but the main cast is Dennis Quaid, Bess Armstrong, Simon McCorkendale, Louis Gossett Jr., John Putch, Leah Thompson, and P.H. Moriarty. The cinematography by James A. Contner. It's... It's fine. It's decent enough. I wouldn't say this is like the best looking movie cinematography wise. Uh, the editing by Randy Roberts and Corky Ellers. There are some scenes here where it's a little choppy, but for the most part, I don't think it's that rough. I think it's a decent, solid effort when it comes to the editing. The score, though, by Alan Parker is amazing. Like, this is one of the most underrated scores out there, if you ask me. It is such a rollicking and really fun score to listen to. And it fits the tone of the film so well. Because at the end of the day, this movie has the vibe of a ride at SeaWorld. And I think that's fitting. And I think if you are able to put yourself into that mindset of, I am on a turn your brain off thrill ride at SeaWorld in the 80s, 
I think there's a lot of fun that can be had with Jaws 3. And I think it does deliver the goods when it comes to uh, the kind of things that you're looking for when it comes to a summer blockbuster. I mean, you got a giant shark. And I felt that a lot of the shots of the shark and a lot of the effects of the shark, by the way, were really impressive and deserve way more credit. Uh, a lot of people just bash the film based on that one scene with the shark that looks like a loaf of bread. But if you see the entire film, there are shots in this of the giant shark, which is working underwater. The dorsal fin is moving and swaying. Everything is working properly. And it's impressive. It's a sight to behold. It's, it's honestly pretty jaw-dropping at times. The size of this shark. And I think that effect deserves a hell of a lot more credit. There's also some nice uh, model work and some nice uh, visual effects. The gore, when it is there, some of it's just really kind of ruined because it's trying to be a 3D gimmick. That's really all that it's there for. Like the severed arm and Overman's body. And it was just, things just look kind of weird. Like, it's just not anatomically correct or something. There's just something cartoonish and something really off about some of the 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 few bits of gore that you do see here. Um, and there are some moments when it gets to the finale with the big shark that's loose in the park where it does feel like you could have gone bigger where you could have had more attacks, you could have had more scenes, where the shark is doing some crazier stuff, but there's still some nice set pieces, and it still features a really explosive finale and ending, and I thought the shot of the shark's entrails and the shark's jaw flying towards the screen, I always thought that was a pretty cool effect. Uh, and... It's one of those movies that it's enjoyable. It goes by at a pretty good pace. I didn't think it was that boring. Although it does have some pacing issues in the middle. Uh, and this is one of those movies where I think it's just... And, and Jaws 3D is one of those films where... As a horror film, it's not that scary, but as an adventure movie, as a thrill ride, it's definitely one of those films that will get your adrenaline pumping enough, and it's one of those movies where, after it's over, it makes you feel good, despite the deaths and despite this other stuff, it really does nail the vibe of an eighties theme park experience. And I, I think if you look at it from that perspective, I think you will come away with it, uh, feeling rather, uh, pleased, uh, instead of trying to compare it to the jaws or even something like jaws Two. this is more of a, 80s amusement park uh, ride for the family. That's really, honestly, uh, the, the kind of vibe that this film has. It's just one of those movies where never understood the hate. I still don't understand it. A 3.8 out of 10 on IMDb? Really? It's not that fucking bad. And I've always uh, had a, a little bit of a soft spot for it. And as always, I'll see you later. See ya.